gentlemen. Did you press it? Yeah, I pressed it. <laughs> Welcome to the most exciting part of your week. Welcome to Biblical Poetry. Again, I'm asking again, who has ever studied Biblical Poetry in their entire life? Raise your hand. Last week. Last week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm teaching this class, um, to help you guys understand Biblical Poetry. Poetry makes up a huge portion of the Bible. Do you know which book of the Bible contains the most poetry? Psalms. 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 <laughs> Psalms is the longest book in the Bible by chapters. You guys know what the longest book is by words? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible by words. Do you know what the longest book in the New Testament is? It's actually kind of easy. New Testament. Acts. Yeah, Acts. Yes! <laughs> Um, the, the, com com the combination of, of narrative and poetry makes up the majority of the Bible. The small portion of the Bible will be epistles, right? Like the, the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, something like that is the smallest part of the portion of the Bible. And so because poetry makes up so much of the Bible, we need to learn how to read it. Okay, so I'm going to kind of review what we did a little bit last week. Number one, <coughs> in reading any book of the Bible, any passage of the Bible, number one is you have to set up that way. You have to set up context. context. All right, and I, and I told you guys uh, what happens when you set it up well, what happens when you set it up bad. All right, uh, when you when you set it up well, you're gonna be able to apply it to your own life. It's so hard to write vertically. Apply to your own life, and also it makes every book of the Bible valuable. I, this, this is the key. I think I've been I've been going to church now for like yeah, it was like 15 years, something like that. All right, I can probably count how many times I've heard a sermon preached out of a book of poetry. All right, whether it be a minor prophet, whether it be Psalms, whether it be uh, Proverbs, whether it be anything. Right? There's I can literally count the amount of times. I've heard a sermon preached uh, from one of these books. It's just kind of, kind of culture, right? The majority, the majority of sermons in America are based on what? New Testament. And what book's New Testament? Matthew. Uh, not even that. Not even that. I would say most of Romans. the Romans, right? Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, usually the epistles. Okay. And I, th I, think, I think part of it, honestly, is because unless you really uh, take time to understand context and why it's important, you're not going to find poetry very valuable in the Bible, right? Because you're going to be like, well, it's kind of just there, right? It's like songs are valuable in your free time, but you don't like go out and teach, you know, take a poetry class. You're like, you're so stupid. Why are you wasting your time? <laughs> okay, right? But I want you guys to see that poetry is valuable. <clears throat> if you don't understand context and stuff, um, bad examples of poetry. I shared with you guys last week. Share your story again because it's a really great story, right? I saw this uh, demonstration against gay marriage. Right? And these guys are holding a sign that says, God hates gays. And I was like, Genesis something something. Right? And I looked it up, and the pastor was like, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And they used that passage to prove that God hates gays. <laughs> Gain the fact that Esau had many wives <laughs> and many children. All right? um, in, in poetry, you see, a, I think, a lot of um, bad examples when people just read, read, up, like, read the Psalms, right? and just start drawing crazy illustrations into it. Right, like every word means something different, right? So like, oh, so the stars are like my dreams, and like God being the stars, like God is in my dreams, and so then when I fall asleep, it's like God's talking to me, and like everything in my dreams is God talking to me, right? And it's like that's how I know God is talking to me, right? Because poetry is so ambiguous, people just draw whatever they want into the poetry, all right? So that is like always the craziness, and that's what we're trying to avoid. All right, how to set a context. Um, number one, what is the most important thing about context? First thing you should do. Compare with the same Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me narrow down that question. Um, when, you, when you sit down to study a book, what's the first thing you need to understand about that book? That's the first thing you need to understand about that book. That's going to be finding everything else, you, you, every, every other research you do. Time period. Okay. <laughs> time period is first. Oh, why, <laughs> why time period? Leslie? Why'd you say that? Um, Whatever. 
I was angry. Because you said I lost. <laughs> you remember? Um. <coughs> so you can go investigate the other literatures of that time period. Okay, investigate the other literature of that time period. But also, like, for, here's an example, right? Why can't I just compare poetry from today from poetry 3,000 years ago and say, see? Like, we're just the same, we're the same people dealing with the same problems. It's because of the worldview, too. Right? The worldview is a huge thing. Uh, worldview, also the, the, the history behind that, the culture behind that, time period is really important. If you say, there's a Roman Empire today, I would be like, there's a Rome today, there's a Roman Empire today. <laughs> right? Understand time period, understand that some things stop existing. Right? And so to understand that some things when you see in poetry and you think it's like, oh, that's America. I'm like, well, obviously that's not America. You know? Like, you'd be surprised. Some people, when you take the Bible to other, other countries who've never seen the Bible before, and they're like, oh, is this a book from, about America? They have the Bible, right? They're like, it's not about America. <laughs> it kind of predates America by a couple thousand years. So, time period. In the book of Joel, how do we find that time period? The book of Joel. It's kind of a trick question. It's actually in the text. Study Bible. Study Bible. Okay. Uh, what, study, what, study, what study Bible is that I recommend to you guys? Yeah, Archipelago. The NIV Study Bible is actually the, the best selling study Bible in the world. All right, so if you guys go to any bookstore, you guys should be able to find it. Um, again, I'm not going to recommend. I'm not going to say it against you. Don't get that John MacArthur or the Reformation the Study Bible or the whatever, whatever, whatever. Right, but you should at least have a moderate view of the study Bible that you're using also, just so you can interact with people who are not your own denomination and such. Okay, so study Bibles. Um, does anyone have them here? By the way, no one uses them in church. The one, the one I have is like really thin, I didn't, I didn't bring it today. Um, but yeah, study Bible, you can also use a website called what? Um, I will give away actually, I don't think they have it. It's a website you guys probably all use every day. Google. Not Wikipedia. Google. Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia. Okay. Um, again, something, something you gotta understand about Wikipedia, okay? Very important. Because if you guys want to go to UCSD, you have professors who are Jewish and such. Uh, a lot of scholars all right, try to really mess with the Bible. All right, so you guys are old enough now, you guys should know that, right? People have different views. One of the things that a lot of scholars today try to do, with especially the poetic literature, right, they're going to say almost everything was written after, after the exile. Okay? A lot of scholars today to prove that you know, God did not get a revelation, because a lot of prophetic books are that, they're prophetic. They actually predict things that will happen. Right, and so a lot of scholars start with a mind worldview of like, well, that's impossible. You can't predict things, so they'll date everything late, right? They'll date like the Exodus, like late. They're like, well, Moses, like Moses didn't actually write this. It was like someone way after Moses to justify the Israelites coming out of Egypt, so they wrote this book. All right, so just gotta understand that when you read Wikipedia. Um, I think the articles should at least have some of the conservative Christian thought. Um, and here's here's an easy way to do this. If you look at your Bible. Look, look, go to the table of contents real quick for your Bible. <clears throat> if, you, if you go to your table of contents, I'll teach you something. This is, this is the conservative view, not, and not everyone holds this view. Okay? But um, the books of the prophets are, are divided in, in, in kind of this. They're the major prophets, which is our Isaiah, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, Daniel's considered a major, right? <clears throat> and then um, those, that's pretty much that order, okay? So it was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel writes from exile, all right? And then starting again, starting with the minors, Hosea through Malachi, those are roughly in chronological order. And I say roughly, right? Because some of the books will, will trade spots. But roughly, roughly speaking, if you want to find out which book happened for the others, right? Um, we know pretty much for sure that Malachi was the last book written of the primitive books. All right? It's like Malachi, 400 years of science, and then uh, probably the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Um, and we know that Hosea was a prophet of the earlier period, before the exile. So if you guys want to know time period-wise, when you guys say this, the minor prophets are written roughly in what we believe um, the order they were written in. Okay? All right, coming back. That's going to help you guys, hopefully. And again, that's the conservative view. Not all, not all professors and scholars will agree with that. That's the conservative view. Um, Joel. 
Some books, it's easy to find out what, what time period they're from because the book itself will tell you. So let's look at Joel. <clears throat> In verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. What does that tell you about Joel? It tells you that he's a son of Pethuel. If we had archaeological evidence of a man named Joel or who's the son of Pethuel, we could date this. We do not have that, we do not have the evidence today, okay? Um, some some of the some of the books we do have enough evidence so we can date it pretty accurately. Here's an example. How do we know King David actually existed? We dug. We dug, but like, like what do we find that tells us that King David actually existed? Do we have records about him? We don't we don't have written records, it's too early. Right? When you when you go into the BCs, you almost have no written records. In terms of like like scrolls and stuff, because it'll, it'll decay, obviously. <coughs> The one solid piece of evidence that like, is almost like, irrefutable by even super secular liberal scholars is that we found like this... Um, so in the Middle East, empires just like we do today, when you win a victory, right, what do you do? Like you erect monuments and you have like, inscriptions and stuff. And usually stone. Stone doesn't, those stones doesn't decay like paper does. So we, we dug up like this... Uh, you can Google this later. I forgot what it's called. It's like... It's not an obelisk, but it's like a cylinder. It's like a stone cylinder. And it's one of the Assyrian kings. And he basically wrote like, and I invaded, you know, the house of David. Right? And so, scholars first queue up like, wait a minute, the house of David? And the fact that a king will write that means the house of David was a really powerful empire. Right? Like the house of David, and I defeated so-and-so governor, da 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 Right? And so when you, when you read the inscription, you know, well, first of all, David's gone. Right? And this is 100 years after David. But they still call it the house of David. Second of all, his empire was big enough that it's worthy enough to conquer this place that he would actually write this down, right? And so that's one of our big pieces of evidence that King David existed, that his empire was actually big enough he would care about, okay? Um, so, bring that back. If you look on Wikipedia, some, some books will have enough evidence to date pretty accurately, right? We can be like, probably 700 BC, 800 BC, pretty sure on this, because we have enough records from that. The Book of Joel is interesting because we don't, right? Um, if you're a conservative Christian, one of the things you can easily do is look at the book itself. Sometimes it'll tell you. So, here's a famous passage from, from Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, right? If you remember from Isaiah 6, that famous passage we always preach on. We can date that, right? Because if, then you find out when King Uzziah was, we can date the book of Isaiah to that period. <clears throat> the book of Joel is a little bit harder. Right? The book of Joel opens with, I am Joel, the son of da 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 Right? And Pethuel isn't a king. <laughs> you know, so it's harder to date. So, why did I bring up the Book of Joel? Um, when you can't date something super accurately, what you're going to do is just, I encourage you guys to look at the Minor Prophet list. So, look at your Bibles. What book does Joel fall after and before? <clears throat> what book is before Joel? Okay. And Hosea starts, starts the Minor Prophets, okay, because Daniel is the last major, right? So what, what does that tell you? It tells you it's one of the earlier Minor Prophets, right? <clears throat> There's one thing you need to understand. Let me, let me tell this to you guys now. No one in church ever teaches this, and I had to learn this myself. When I finally learned it, it changed the way I look at the Bible, okay? So let me tell you a story. <laughs> it's a good story. I'm, I'm going to go through hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years of Bible history really quick. Okay, um, the first, who was the first prophet after the period of Judges? That's how I talked about him. Samuel. Samuel, okay. Here's Sam. The hobbit. <laughs> Sam's a hobbit. <laughs> okay, who, who does Samuel know to be king? Saul. Saul is really tall, right? And you have the first king of Israel. Yeah. And then what happens after Saul? David. David, okay. David. David's shorter. He's buff. He's naked. Okay. <laughs> then what happens after David? Solomon. Solomon. Okay. He's like a shiny because he's rich. He has long hair or something. Okay. And so, so, you, so you, guys, you, guys, you guys know that progression, right? What happens after Solomon? His son. Okay, who was his son? I don't know. They got rocked by um, the north. Okay, so basically, you go to you go to Jeroboam or Rehoboam, and 
bunch of the, the minor kings. Okay, but hey, I'm gonna fast forward through all of that. Here's what you need to understand. After Solomon, everything goes down. Okay, it's so down that we're down here. <laughs> all right. So basically, you have a bunch of other kings, and then this is what happens to Israel. All right, imagine. It's gonna suck. Imagine this is the land of Israel. All right, it's, oh, wow. it's sucky. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> you have, you have later in Israel, you have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Alright? And this is how they refer to it. In the Bible, they almost always refer to Israel for the northern kingdom or Samaria later on. Okay? And then for the bottom kingdom, it's, almost, it's always called Judah. Again, I'm going to fast forward through this, but the story basically is because um, Sol Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam gets on the throne, and they're basically like, Rehoboam, what are you going to do? He's like, bring in all my father's advisors, right? And they're like, okay, we serve the father of Solomon, he's a really wise guy, we advised him, all right? So listen to us. Your father was hard on those people, say to the people, they'll be nice to them, they'll, they'll serve you forever. Then Rehoboam brings in, his, his friends were 20, right? He's like, what do you guys do? You know what you do? Crush them. Tell them, your father's telling you whips, I was thinking with scorpions, right? And Rehoboam was like, all right, I'll listen to you. So he goes out to the people, and he's like, all right, guys, I'm just going to destroy all of you. <laughs> right? People are like, excuse me? And they all leave. All right? And basically, that day, he loses all the tribes of northern Israel. All, right? all of them basically joined Jeroboam, who was like a rebellious guy. Um, and they formed the northern kingdom. And then like, the tribe of Judah and some of the other southern tribes stay with him, and they become a lot smaller, become the southern kingdom. All right, here's also a bit of trivia. The way they were able to do that also is he, set, he sets up sites of worship in northern, northern and southern is, uh, Israel because like the temple, the temple stuff is in here in Judah, right? So the only way he can hold power is he creates altars of worship, I use quotation marks, because they don't worship God anymore, right? And so basically like they set up idols here in the north and here in the south, all right? And they stop going to the temple here, here in the south. And so because of that, something super happens. 722 BC. You know what day that is? Independence. Exactly. You guys never been taught this in church. Exile. <laughs> okay? They go into exile. <clears throat> they go first. They go first, arguably, because they fall to idols first. Right? Because the southern kingdom still has some good kings. If you, if you read that book of the kings and uh, chronicles, stuff like that, the southern kingdom still has some good kings left. Right? They're in the temple, they turn back to God. The northern kingdom almost never turns back to God. Right, so very early on, they go into exile. So what does that mean? The, the Assyrians come. Okay, so you guys know the Middle East, right? This is, this is Israel, this is Egypt, down here. Right, and then the, the Assyrians, like everything over here is like the Assyrians. All right, and the Assyrians come, and they take them into exile to Assyria. The reason why there's exile, right, is what happens if, if I come to your country, take over your country, install myself as king, and say, don't rebel, <laughs> what are you going to do? Rebel. You're going to rebel, right? What if, what if, like, let's say China invades the U.S., right, and takes Americans into exile in China? Are you going to rebel? No. Probably not, <laughs> okay? Even if China's American, right, even if you're used to that culture, you're still not going to rebel, all right, just because you're in a foreign land. That's the same idea. The Syrians take the northern kingdom into exile. The reason why this word is important, okay? The exile is going to define the prophets, right? Meaning this, um, if you look at like the books of Jeremiah, for example, right? Who's, that, who's actually read Jeremiah? Raise your hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so read Jeremiah. What you see all the time the prophets, the prophets will warn them. If you stop sinning, if you stop sinning, God will not destroy you. He will not destroy you, right? And guess what? They don't stop sinning. <laughs> and so they go into exile. Um, Later on, the southern kingdom goes into exile too, right? But they go into exile in the Babylonians. Right? But it's this idea of exile. Everything before the exile, all right, is going to be a warning. Man, it's terrible, right? Everything before the exile is going to be a warning. So when you look at the books like Hosea, right? God says, you know, I will woo you and you will come back to me, right? You are, have, you have gone astray, you have done your own things, you have sold yourself to other lovers, right? It's warning before the exile. 
during the exile, this is major things, right? This is not the only thing there. It's promise. <clears throat> right? So here's an example. In Daniel, what, what, is, what does Daniel see? What does Daniel say to Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel sees the statue, right? And this rock shatters the statue. The rock is Jesus, right? And so what Daniel sees is this promise of them coming out of exile, coming back to the land of God. After exile, here's how we define it. Is the prophetic. Um, let, me, let me add to that. It's the prophetic kingdom. These are major things. These are major things I would draw. Um, if you look at, for example, Malachi. There's a famous section from Malachi. I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, and the sons to the fathers. <clears throat> After, after exile, they come back and it kind of sucks, right? Like, if you, if you, if you remember, if you read your Bible in Israel, you think about Solomon's kingdom, you're like, dude, that was good times. All right, we were, like, super rich. It says in Solomon's kingdom, silver was so common, it wasn't worth anything. Even today, silver is worth something, okay? Copper is still worth something. People, like, I don't know if you guys read the news, but, like, people, like, strip statues, all right? Like, cut heads off statues here in San Diego to get this, the copper and stuff out of it. And during Solomon's kingdom, they were so rich that they didn't care about that kind of stuff. So if you come out of exile and you're like, wow, this is it. <laughs> this is the promise. <laughs> right? We get back to it, like our homes are burned down and like the temple is like not as nice as it before. That, this is it. And so what, what God says to the people is, there is a kingdom coming. Right? And that's, how, that's why when Jesus says, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is here. Right? <laughs> That's why it's a big deal. It's because the prophets prophesied that, right? They prophesied the coming, the kingdom will come. Okay, you, if you guys don't write this down, please remember this. All right, I've made it really easy for you guys. There's an exile. <laughs> all right. The Assyrians first, Babylonians beat the Assyrians, and then that's why Babylonians are later. There's an exile. Almost everything before the exile is about warning. Almost everything, everything during is about promise, and almost everything afterward is about the prophetic kingdom. Is that Rocky Rolly T? That just changed the way we read the Bible. <laughs> Alright. Um, th this concept is so important. If you read, for example, uh, the accounts in Kings, and you read the accounts of Chronicles, they're different. Okay, and if you go to UCST, your professors will be like, oh my gosh, see, the Bible is inaccurate because these accounts are like telling different things. Do you know why? Kings is written before the exile, Chronicles is written after the exile. Right? <clears throat> this whole idea shapes everything. Why, why, is, why did kings paint a bad picture of like, the kings of Israel before the exile? It's trying to show them, you guys are bad. That's why you're in exile. Right? It's like, it's like don't be surprised waking up one day in Babylon and be like, why did this happen to us? Because the prophetic book's like, okay, look back at your kings. And you wonder why you're in exile? Chronicles doesn't do that. Chronicles is like, okay, now that you know, you've suffered enough, Chronicles comes back and says, okay, now that you're out of exile, does God still love you? Does God still have a promise for you? And Chronicles tries to show you that God does still have a plan. So Chronicles paints everyone in a better light to show you that the plan of God never stopped, even though they were sinful. Okay? Your mind is blown, isn't Leslie? <laughs> if you get nothing from this class, I hope you guys are interested in reading Old Testament more. Okay? So, Joel is... Post, pre, or during exile? Someone give me a guess. Well, I just told you guys like 10 seconds ago. Is Joe Paul, uh, pre, post, or during exile? I told you how you guys can find out. Pre exile. He's pre exile. Most likely. Uh, that's my guess. Um, you, you can't say for sure, right? Just because like, there's no internal evidence or not enough archaeological evidence. But if you go in by the chronology of the books, then he's going to be post. He's going to be post. And so because he's pre, what is the, what is the major thing? Warning. Pre. Warning. Good. Let me have you guys read. <clears throat> um, let, me have, let me have a reader start from chapter 1, verse 1. And everyone take two verses. So, sorry, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. 
Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell your, their children, and their children another generation. What the cutting <coughs> locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty armor, army without number. It has the teeth of the lion, the fangs of the lioness. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away, its branches are made white. My man's like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. The spare of you farmers, the way of you vine grows, green for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The wine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees in the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Alright, let's, let's stop there real quick. Alright, <clears throat> this, this will be enough for us to apply how we look at poetry, and how we the Bible in general. How we, how we fill in my acronym. <coughs> What's the first word? Author. And again, this is important because of this. Right, helps us get a time period, helps us to get figure out where it is in the Bible. Author, what's the second one? Audience. I still think aim could be the last one. What? Oh, no, okay. I still think aim could be the last one. Okay, well, you know I know. <laughs> okay, audience. Um, again, is it is the community pre, during, or post exile? All right, and a lot of the Bible is like this. You can, you can take that theme to apply to a lot of the Bible. Audience, who's he talking to? Um, he names one sin specifically in this section. What is that sin? Drinking. Drinking. Okay. <clears throat> it's important to figure out um, who the audience is. Okay. Um, if you don't, if you don't figure what the audience is, like bad preachers will be like, you see, see church, this is what happens when you guys. Don't volunteer for homeless ministry. All right? You see what happens to look at read Joel. All right? And you'll be like, wait, that's not going to do anything. All right? um, I'm not saying that you, can't, you shouldn't use Joel for anything but drinking. Okay? But then one thing he doesn't point out specifically is drinking. Again, this is poetry. Right? Poetry tries, tries to paint in broad, in broad uh, steps. So what do you think is associated with drinking? Because drinking itself is not the main set, right? But what's associated with drinking? Okay, okay, drunkenness, but what else? Debauchery. Okay, debauchery. Um, basically, basically, how I define debauchery, it's like you were made to serve God. You were made to be holy, acceptable, and pleasing to God. Debauchery is messing up the image of who you are. Right? It's like, why would you be embarrassed as an American if you saw President Obama going to the club and getting drunk and like pass out on the floor? Why would that embarrass, Peter, why would that embarrass you as an American? It's a bad image of our leadership and it's country. Us. Right? Mm. <clears throat> and so as Christians, we represent God. And so when we're passed out on the floor and doing something like that, it's, it's shameful. Right? It's shameful to Christians everywhere. So that's the that's sin of debauchery. Another sin from drinking. Try it out. Come on, guys. Two star me out. Lost some motor skills. Is it lost in inhibition? Yeah, that's how I see it. Is your 
I know in America we love to go crazy and laugh, lots of reason. Um, you do bad things, okay? <laughs> you do bad things. If you work, if you work with enough homeless people, you realize how bad drinking is. Because when you drink, it breaks families apart, right? You say things you don't mean to say. You hurt people you don't mean to hurt. Um, you <coughs> drive drunk and you kill people, right? It's the loss of inhibitions. What else is from drinking? Julie, yeah. It's pretty expensive. expensive. Yes. <laughs> Someone help Why? <laughs> because no, there must be other stuff. If you drink too much, then the good stuff doesn't taste good anymore. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good stuff tastes better. No, like, like you know, like cheap wine or something. Good wine okay. Look, look, let me let me ask <laughs> <laughs> this then. Browsing. Okay. Almost all. Most people who are drunkards are right, drinking in the presence of opposite sex, right? And so there's carousing. Carousing. Carousing basically is a sin. Uh, associate with the way with someone who's not your husband or your wife, right? In a very like, lustful kind of way. <coughs> Something you have to understand about Hebrew poetry. Does Hebrew poetry, how does American poetry work? If, 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 I, if I wrote a poem and said, this is a poem, this is a long poem, this is the end of my poem, is that a good poem? No. Why? Yes. The line is <laughs> what? There's no purpose. There's no purpose for what else? Except the poem's going to be long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe it's solved, right? Maybe it's like postmodern, so it's like, oh, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> a, a lot of what American poetry does, right, um, is, it, is it, it's, it makes it clever, it makes stuff clever off the rhymes of what it does. Right, you guys notice that? Like songs? Like, all, all songs are a good rhyme. Yeah. Right, you guys know that? Okay. Um, in American songs, that's how we do it. So, we, if you have, who's taking poetry in here? No one? Who's, who's ever written a song? Do you ever written a song? You've never, never written a song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Almost always when you write a song, right, what do you do? You write a line out, and then you stop. And then you write the second line. And what do you do to the second line? You rhyme to the first line, right? Or you do a first and third line rhyme. Hebrew poetry is not the same. <clears throat> okay. And to be thankful that it's not the same. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme. Right? Even if it did, you would never know, right? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Look at verse 1. <coughs> this, this, this is a great example. This is a great example of, of Hugh poetry. Um, the NIV actually does a really good job of this. Let me... I don't know. But I don't think it's Okay. So if you look at verse four, what the swarming, what the locust swarm has left, the locust, great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts <coughs> have eaten. You see what I'm doing there? It's not rhyming, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's not a plan of words on the word left. <laughs> it's like let me write the word left with left. Okay, that's not very clever. <laughs> right? It's not clever. What we're trying, what we're trying to do is this. It's, it's, it's parallelism. Right? It's basically saying like, here's, here's a, I, I'm not a good at doing this kind of stuff, right? It's like saying like, cat, young cat. Wow. <laughs> dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Big dog. <laughs> dog. Animals. House animals. You see what I did there? Right? So, so what I'm doing with this, what I'm, doing this, I'm saying cat, second line. What kind of cat? A young cat. Dog. What kind of dog? Big dog. What am I talking about? Animals. House animals. Alright? That's kind of deep. When I think about that, you're like, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> that's how Hebrew poetry works. Hebrew poetry uh, is, is, is a parallelism. Right? It's usually when the first first time you say something, third and fourth say something, and then it'll close out with something. All right? Or the first and third, second and fourth, something like that. You see what I'm saying? It's it's the ideas that have symmetry, not the words themselves. Is that blowing my In English, the words themselves have symmetry. Right? Like, like you are my fire, the one 
Desire. You see, you see what I'm saying? Right? So I'm, I'm making a play of Fire and Desire. Almost every song does that now. Right? It plays out Fire and Desire. It's most, that's the most common rhyme in, in, in English songs. In Hebrew poetry, the play the plays off the idea. The play is off cat, kind of cat, young cat, dog, kind of dog, big dog, right? Verse 4. What the locust swarms have left, what locust swarms? Great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, again, playing off that first line, right? The young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. You see what it's doing there? Right? It's, 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 what it's trying to do is trying to paint this picture of like a <coughs> massive locust army. I'll give another example in English. <coughs> a razor blade. Well, why do they always write rhyme? Why do they always rhyme fire with desire? Because it's easy. It's easy. It's easy because they rhyme, right? But also because like they're very similar ideas. Because a lot of our desire burns, right? And so when you have that image, what if I rhyme fire with tire? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like I got a fire in my heart and I kick the tires of my car. Right? And I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 nothing, That's right? I mean, right? If, you, if I did that in a song, you'd be like, that means nothing, <laughs> right? Well, if you had fire in your heart, why would you keep the tires in your car? Maybe there's context. But you see what I'm doing there. You see, you see what I'm doing there, right? You have to rhyme it, and, have, and, and those rhymes carry the meaning, carry the weight of the meaning. And this is not the rhyme themselves that carry the meaning. It's, it's the idea that carries the meaning. Okay, this is, I know this is deep for you guys. All right, some of you guys are not artistic, but this is deep. <laughs> And so when you guys read Hebrew poetry, and actually, if you, can, if you can't visualize it, just draw it out, okay? So, do you guys know what locusts look like? Yeah. It's like a grasshopper. It's like a grasshopper. Okay, so here's my best attempt. Fabulous. All right, here's... Dude, this is going to suck. Okay, here's the grasshopper. This is the grasshopper. Here's the eye. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Imagine like a bajillion of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like six <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you remember that draw, I can draw that, right? Yeah, that. <laughs> like, um, Im imagine, imagine like a painting, right, where the entire painting is just locusts. Right? It's just locusts and everything's playing, playing, playing in black and brown. And in your mind's eye, what is that? You have the picture of oppression, right? Of this massive army coming just to eat everything and to swallow the sun. <clears throat> That's what the author's trying to do with these words, okay? Is that he's trying to, he's trying to draw this picture in your mind of this is a massive plague of locusts. And actually, there's a movie, Hid Hidalgo, or actually a lot of the Middle Eastern movies have that, where you see like swarms of locusts, right? And they're trying to paint that with words here, okay? So, basic interpretation. So that's like, okay, what's the big deal about that? <clears throat> now for something deeper and theological. Author, audience, what's the P? Perspective. Really? Purpose. Purpose. <laughs> Purpose. <coughs> what is the author trying to do? Alright, let's, let's look at the text. Tell me, tell me when you find it. Tell me, guess what you think the purpose is. It's in a, it's in a, it's in a verse with all digits. It's in a it's in a verse with double digits in the first chapter. The purpose is pretty obvious in this section. How do you find it? The verse number is with a one. It's in the tens. Tell me what verse you look at. Thirteen. Thirteen. All right. This is this is very easy because it gives you a verb. All right. Purpose. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Okay, again, let's go back to how the structure works, right? First line, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Right? Who ministers before the altar? Priests. Right? So, there's, so, so that, that's the rhyme. That's the parallel. Right, first line, priests who go for the altar, mourn. <clears throat> Second pair, come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. Who ministers before my God? It's a play on priests. Right? It's a play on priests, but in some ways it draws farther out to the people, right? For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Again, it's a play, it's a play off the, the idea. 
Where do you bring the grain offerings when you drink offerings? To the house of God. Last line. But it's withheld from the house of God. <clears throat> Here's a clue how to do it. Find the verb. In most sessions, in most sessions, especially po uh, prophetic stuff, if you can find the verb, right? Let's find an English word for this. What's a verb that you command someone to do? Imperative? No. I don't. I don't know. Good enough English. Wait, what? <laughs> this. Whatever. Find the verb that makes you that command something. Okay. In a lot of um, prophetic literature, if you find the verb that the, the that the prophet himself is saying to you, "Go do this." That's the purpose. For this. Verse 13, put on sackcloth to priest and mourn. And it's parallel with what? Verse 14. Verse 14 says, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Okay? L look at that, look at how it parallels again. Declare a holy fast. What is a holy fast? A sacred assembly. Summon the elders. Who are the elders? And all who live in the land. Right? So who are you summoning? Everybody. The leaders and the people. <clears throat> Next line. To the house of the Lord your God. Why? What are you going to do with the house of the Lord your God? And cry, out, and cry out to the Lord. You see, you see that structure again? Right? First line, second line. And each line builds off the other. So, again, what's the purpose? Declare a holy fast. Call a safe assembly. <clears throat> find the verb. Okay? Find, find the verb in prophetic literature, and you can find out um, what the author's trying to say. Okay. And so, you, you do all this, you're like, that's great, David. Thank you for showing me a book about locusts and people who cry and why life is so sucky and why drinking leads to all these bad things. All right, why is it affecting my life? Um, I want to share with you guys um, personal stories from my own life, all right? Um, and also just some other parts of the Bible so you guys can see why it's important. Uh, I'll start with my own life, all right? One of, the, one of the sections that I really liked and really helped me, um, let's go to Genesis 22. <coughs> it's not in the prophetic books, but it's, uh, it's kind of like biblical poetry in a sense. Alright, Genesis 22, I'm looking at verse 15. And this is, this is the account of Abraham after he offered his, offered his son Isaac up, right? And then God had decided to spare him. The angel of the Lord came to call to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, because the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as stars in the sky and as sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. This is not strict biblical poetry, right? This is from a narrative book. Bob said the language is poetic, right? Sand, I will make your descendants as numerous as stars in the sky. Sand is history. It's not, it's not literal, right? God didn't say, I'm going to give you 8 trillion da, 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 sons and daughters, right? It's not what we're trying to make, right? He's trying to draw a picture in Abraham's mind. Um, when I was in Shanghai for the first time back in 2005, um, and I was kind of just visiting my family, Exploring if I wanted to do to do missions and ministry there. There is actually I have it on my phone. There's, there's a tower. Okay, if you guys see any any skyscape of Shanghai, you'll see this tower. It's the Pearl Pearl TV Tower. <clears throat> it used to be the tallest building in Shanghai, and now there's a bunch of ones higher than that. But if you look at this this uh, this ball right here, right on the top ball, it's like an observation deck, right where it's like glass and where you can look out. <clears throat> and I remember. I remember going to, going to this observation deck. I went with myself, so my mom didn't want to pay 10 bucks to go up there. Okay. She's like, I've seen this before, just go by yourself. So I went to this observation deck, and I was just, I, and I saw like the vastness of Shanghai. It's, it's gigantic. It's a city of like 20 something million people, and it's skyscrapers in all directions. And I, and, I, and I was thinking to myself, like, am I, am I called to be here? And if I am called to be here, how am I ever going to reach out to this city? Right, the city is 20 million people, and I'm like, by the time I was like, you know, 19 years old, you know, and I was thinking like, I have no professional ministry experience. Like, I've never done anything in my entire life, right? I've, all I've done is go to college so far. So you guys 
not how I feel, right? Like, all I've done, all I've, all I've done so far in my life is go to college. Like, how am I ever going to do ministry here? And I remember just praying to God and saying, like, you know what? I need assurance that I'm not just wasting my life. Because if you tell your parents, like, I want to do missions, they're like, what are you going to do? You're going to be like, I don't know, I'm going to show up. <laughs> I'm going to wake up and go to church, and then that's how I'm going to do missions. All right? Like, you can't, it's not, nothing you're going to say to people that make them really believe in what you're doing early on in life. And so I was, I was really struggling with that. I was like, man, what can a 19 year old do? And this verse was actually impressed on my heart. Okay? And this is how, and this is how you apply biblical poetry here. Watch carefully how I did this. Who's God talking to in this section, Genesis 22? He's talking to Abraham. Okay? I want you to catch that first of all. He's talking to Abraham, not, not talking to us. <clears throat> But what does Jesus call people who have faith? Sons of Abraham. Right? Why? It's this idea that the people of Israel, the people of Israel have always been a people of faith, not physical blood. For example, Rahab, not an Israelite, part of, the, part of the lineage of Jesus. Right? The book of Ruth, right? Not an Israelite, part of the lineage of Jesus. There's a bunch of people in Scripture who are not even um, Israelites but they get grafted into the branch of Israel. Because the people of God have always been the people of faith. Okay? So, starting with that, I, I look at this passage and I say, God, if you sing this to Abraham, and if we are sons of Abraham, not by physical, by actual blood, but by faith, God says to, God says to the people of faith, your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. What does that mean? This is, God, is God actually saying to Abraham, I'm going to make you a conqueror. Right? I'm going to make you so that you can conquer all these cities around you and take their money and take their wives and take their children. Right? Is that what God saying? Right? Did Jesus Christ come to earth so that he can dominate the Roman Empire? He'd be like, I told you so. I'm stronger than you. <laughs> right? If you didn't know, now you know. Got better weapons. Is that what he's trying to say? He's not. Right? The imagery that he's trying to paint is that the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God will always overtake the physical kingdoms of the earth. Is that no matter how powerful the Roman Empire gets, God will prevail. No matter how powerful the Babylonian Empire gets, God, the kingdom of God will prevail. God is saying to Abraham, your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Not for material gain, not to conquer them, to dominate them, but to bring the kingdom of God there. That's the promise of this section, right? Because it's, it's poetic language. <clears throat> so I, I, stood, I stood at that Shanghai TV tower, right? And I, I, got, I got this verse in my heart. And I was thinking, so what does that mean for me? What does that mean for like a 19 year old sitting in this tower by himself, you know, praying out by the city? What does it mean when God promises me that I will take possessions of the cities of my enemy? What that, what that meant to me that day was look, I'm 19 years old, right? And this city is like gigantic and the corruption is like ridiculous and like all those people are against me, right? And I preach the gospel and I'm open. But the word of God is powerful. And the word of God has a promise for me. And if, if I believe in that promise, then I have a future. Then I have a hope. <clears throat> that's what, I think that's what the point of the truth is. Right? And so from the way that story finishes, right, is now I work for Women International. <laughs> okay, now I work for a missionary agency. And since then, we've had a lot of missionaries uh, go to Shanghai. Some of us are starting to go, go long term. It's only been five, like five years, five, six years. <clears throat> the, way, the way biblical poetry works is that it paints a picture in your heart that gives you courage. It paints a picture in your heart that helps you have faith in God himself. Very rarely does God just like tell you something like, hey, David, you're going to um, go to this interview, and then the elevator's going to open at 11.05, and you're going to get in the elevator, and then you're going to sit down with like, the guy, and the guy's name will be Sam. And this guy, Sam, will interview you, and then you'll get this job. And after, at 3, 3 o'clock, you will get this phone call, and that's how you know you get the job. That never happens, right? How does God usually speak to us? God usually says to us, do not worry about what you'll eat or drink. <laughs> but Father knows these things, right? And you say you're looking for a job, so what does that mean? That paints a picture in your mind that, like, for the things that I'm worried about, God's going to take care of. You notice that? Okay? Because <clears throat> that's how we operate as human beings. Right? Like, to be honest, you don't really need to know when your, when your next job interview is going to be, or when your next grad school, or we're going to study. You don't need to know that, to be honest. Now, even if someone told you, you wouldn't care. It's dumb. It's just details. 
What you really need to know is that God is for you, not against you. What you really need to know in your heart and your mind, right, is that the God of the universe sees the things you're going through and is with you in that. And so how God responds to that, and I'm not giving you details, is that he gives it to you by painting a picture in your heart and your mind, saying that he's with you always. All right? <clears throat> I'll give you another example. Everyone go to, uh, go to Acts 2. Keep, keep your finger, bookmark, Joel 2, and go to Acts 2. Put this baby there, put pen there, something. <clears throat> I'm going to take away this locust. I'm sorry. If you wanted it, I can drop you again. <laughs> In Acts 2, um, some of your Bibles do this. Do you guys see how it's bracketed? Do you guys see how it's, how it's narrowed it? And then it brackets? Right? It has this, like, more, more spacing on the front and the end. When does it start bracketing in Acts 2? Verse, verse 17. Say, say it again. Verse 17. Yeah. So verse 17. Um, and in verse 16, it sets it up, right? This is what's spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh, most of the Bible should do this. If it, if it doesn't, make sure your main version has this. Um, what, the, what the translators do in the, in, the, in the Bible in general is that whenever they believe it's going to Hebrew poetry, they'll start, they'll start bracketing. Right? So then you'll be like, why is the punctuation all off? <laughs> Okay, why do they, why they hit enter so much? It's because they, they clean you into that this is not poetry. Okay, you should not be taking this as narrative. It's not poetry. Verse 16. This is, what, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and those of smoke. The sun will be turned darkness and the moon blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, this is it. This, let me just fast forward to what the episode's about. <clears throat> if you guys remember in Acts 2, it's, it's the day of... Pentecost. Pentecost, okay. So, what, ha what happens in the story? <laughs> Only Tim knows. <clears throat> so Tim, you know that in the story, what happens is, um, they're gathered, waiting, and praying for Jesus' to return. Okay? And people from all different places of Israel, all different countries are there. All of a sudden, the spirit, spirit comes down. It looks like what? Tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. It rests on all people, right? And they start speaking it in each other's languages. And people are like, what the heck is going on? And then, and then Peter stands up. He calls Joel 2. Peter stands up and he quotes Joel 2. If you look at the section, right, you can be like, what are you talking about? How is the sun turned to darkness and how is the moon to blood? Right? Because you can look at the window and like, the sun's still there, it's yellow. Right? It's not darkness. And the moon at night was like a whitish, it wasn't a blood red. <clears throat> you can be like, what are you talking about? Why are you quoting this? This has nothing to do with anything. Right? They're just speaking different languages. Why would you quote a prophetic book? <clears throat> This is what I'm trying to help you guys to do. What is Joel trying to say? <clears throat> if Joel, if Joel is pre out, right, and he's warning the people, what is Joel warning the people about? He's going to miss this question. What is Joel ultimately warning the people of Israel about in his book, the book of Joel? Ultimately, what is one of them about? No, not the exile. That's not ultimately. To repent? Not ultimately. The, he's, he's really scared of one thing, and he wants to warn them about. And it's not the exile. The exile is a bad thing, but not, ultimately not the exile. It tells you, it tells you in here, look at verse 20. Before the coming of the what? The second coming, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. What Joel is ultimately concerned about is the coming of God. Alright, is the coming of God. This is going to blow your mind, okay? To, to explain this concept, you're going to have to understand this. I'm going to get this word. <clears throat> Bithia. 
When did Jesus come? No, just tell me when. Like, when in history did Jesus come? <laughs> what? No, like, when did Jesus come again? Yeah, how do you not know this? Excuse <laughs> <laughs> no, me, like, abstract thing. Tell me something abstract. It's not even exact, essentially. Okay. <laughs> Let me, no, let me ask it this way. But then when will we see Jesus again? That, that's what most Christians would say. Let me challenge you with this. The judgment of God is not in the future. It's Ju now. It's already coming. This is blowing your mind, right? People talk about Revelation as if it's a future event only. <clears throat> it's not. <clears throat> let me tell you this. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord when, is when Jesus comes to reign with authority, right? That all rebellious sins will be punished. And that you will see the reality of who God is coming to the earth. So that what? So that people who were broken will be healed. So that sicknesses, right, will all be mended. And people who do not believe in God will be led to God. That's happening today, right? We see that. That's why we pray for people. Why, why do you pray for people? You can be like, well, God's will is to make you sick. Right? Well, in some ways, yes, because we all get sick. But when, we, when people get healed miraculously, what do we say? It's like, oh, that's, that's cool. It's the coming of the kingdom of God to that person. When someone's led to Christ, who believed in, like, you know, Allah for the longest time, what happened to that person? The kingdom of God came to that person, right? <clears throat> when, someone, when someone is like a murderer, okay? I'm going to use Hitler because that's a safe one to use. It, <clears throat> when, when Hitler kills, like, knows people, and then he's brought to justice, right? Like, we, we defeat the Germans and the World War II ends. What do you call that? Justice. Right? We call that justice. Why? Because it's the punishment of sins. <clears throat> the day of the Lord ultimately is the end of time. For Joel, what was it? It's also exile. Alright? It's when it comes to account. When, when is it also? It's also now. How do you know that? Jesus. The, king, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is now. Is here. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> you see it again in Acts 2. The great day of the Lord. Why does Peter even quote that? Right? Because if you're like a biblical scholar, you're like, well, Peter, don't you know that Joel 2 was written in like 700, 800 BC? And for you quoting it about the exile, it makes no sense because we're not in the Roman Empire. There's no exile anymore. <laughs> okay, you can say that. But what Peter is saying, right, is that when you see the signs of God happening, what does that clue you into? The kingdom of God is coming. <clears throat> the Acts 2, when Thomas came down, is signifying that the kingdom of heaven is breaking into the kingdom of earth. <clears throat> during, during the exile of Israel, what was happening is that God's justice is coming down on Israel. And saying, you think you'll get away with doing whatever you want? You won't. Okay? I will take your entire kingdom into it. Exile. The kingdom of Israel into exile, King David dominated every enemy around him. There was no enemy that David could not defeat in the time. King Solomon was a rich man on earth, six trillion dollars. Six trillion dollars personal wealth. Alright? And you're telling them they're going to go to exile? That makes no sense. But what God, is, what God said to them basically is like, you cannot withstand my judgment. Do not think you're too big to be judged. Right? End of time. The end of time, we believe that when you die or when Christ comes, you stand for the great white throne and you have to give an account for your sins. You account for your sins today. Right? I guarantee you, if you go out here and you steal something from my, like a liquor store, there will be an accounting for sins. There will be judgment. All right? And you can run away for a little bit, but not for long, because God's justice reigns today. So what does that mean? What does that mean in biblical poetry? Okay? <clears throat> In, in biblical poetry, <clears throat> here, here's, a, here's a good picture. This might help some, it won't help others. Oh, I get it. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to go, man. Okay. Here's the 
Here's the thing that's in particular. If, if, I, if I look out on, like a, on a mountain ridge, uh, there's a good mountain here, and I see, and I see a sign that says, Day of the Lord. And someone asks me, on what ridge does it say Day of the Lord? I can tell you. Right? If I'm far enough with it, and, I, and there's a bunch of escalating mountain ridges, right? you're like, on what ridge does it say Day of the Lord? I know it happens on a ridge, Day of the Lord. And on, on every ridge, I can see Day of the Lord, Day of the Lord, Day of the Lord. Right? That's what the prophet sees. What the prophet sees is this, this idea of the day of the Lord. He doesn't actually see exactly when that is or exactly what that looks like. It's kind of far away from it. Right? But he knows that the day of the Lord is happening. <clears throat> In exile, Israelites experience the day of the Lord. Fully? Not fully. But accurately. Right? They get judged for their sins. Today, we get judged for our sins too. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. Just trust me on this. <laughs> okay, bad things will happen to you. If you if you like just are really careless with your dating life, bad things will happen to you. You'll be lonely. If you're careless with your schoolwork, you'll you'll be sad and get kicked out of school. Okay? <clears throat> in the future, in the end of time, it's the ultimate day of the Lord. In in the prophetic books and the Bible in general, alright, we experience a little bit of the kingdom of God, kind of at all times, right? And throughout history, it's been experienced. What prophetic books do is that it's pointing, pointing you to an ultimate reality that is not always experienced. Catch this. It's not always in like what you experience right here. Okay? A lot of times you, we will experience the reality of what God is saying here, here, and this mountain here, here. That's why the reason why we read the prophetic books, all right, is because history right now. Your life today, ET, when you wake up tomorrow morning, okay, <clears throat> you're experiencing the plan of God. Would you would you're gonna experience tomorrow is gonna blow your mind. Okay? <laughs> what you're gonna experience tomorrow is you're gonna experience the kingdom of this world, Satan, waging war against your soul. Right? So the temptations and things of this world that are gonna act against you. Like cars will cut cut you off and people will yell at you and like banks are gonna rip you off, all that stuff. Right? The kingdom of this world. <laughs> And it gets you. But at the same time, you will also experience the love of God, the peace of God, the presence of Jesus, right? And you'll say, is this it? Is this the, is this the kingdom of God? Is Jesus fully here? Well, he's here, but he's not fully here, right? I'm not, I'm not going to expect that we're, we're somewhere around here, <laughs> okay? We're somewhere around these ridges. When we read the prophetic books, when we read biblical poetry, <clears throat> what well, what, you, what we should be looking for is, what does the kingdom of God look like? All right, what does the kingdom of God look like? So here, let's look at Acts 2. <clears throat> Acts 2, verse 17. All right, this is Peter back in, you know, 100 AD. I will pour out my spirit in all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even though my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirits, and in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and bells of smoke. And then, uh, okay, keep reading. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, for the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does Peter do after this? Right? You guys know this is how the, this is how the church in Acts starts. Peter says. And everyone calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, believe in Jesus. Today, if you believe in Jesus, you will be saved. 5,000 come to faith. Are we done? Is, is Joel done? Is that, is that the prophecy of Joel? Right? The 5,000 who, who called on the Lord were saved? Not ultimately, right? A little bit of it. One of the, one of the bridges of it. <clears throat> everyone calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you want, if you want to be a Christian nerd, uh, this happens again in Romans 10. All right, you don't have to go there, but in Romans, in Romans 10, it happens again. In Romans 10, Paul quotes that, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think it's Romans 10, 13. The Bible writers are trying to clue you, clue you into this reality. All right, and so 18, tomorrow when you wake up and you read the prophetic books, I want you to clue, clue into this reality. 
what the prophetic books say about the kingdom of God is what you, what you should be praying for. Alright. Hopefully in our lives, we're going to experience this. We're going to experience people who call on the name of the Lord and they get saved. Hopefully in our lives, what we're praying for is that we will be able to see God pour out His Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters, and they see Him prophesy. We'll see people in the young men in the church have see visions. And the old men in the church have dreams. On the surface, both men and women. I was hoping that hopefully the ministry in the church is not all men, or not all women moving forward, right? That God will pour out His Spirit on these people. The, the promise, the promise for you guys from, from biblical poetry, and especially the prophetic books, is for yeah, it's my computer. It's, I'm out of battery. <laughs> The promise, of, the promise of this book is that whatever you're going through in life, right? When you look at the poetry, when the poetry in the Bible, you see a picture of God speaking into the prom, speaking into the, the places of your life. The promise of the biblical poetry is that you get a picture of who God is, so that <clears throat> you, when you go around, you don't have to wonder what God looks like or how God treats us, right? Because human beings love to do this. Human beings love to make statues. Like, this is God. He's eight arms. He's this elephant. <laughs> okay? Or human beings love to picture God like, God is like a pile of money. Right? My bank account and a bunch of zeros. If you just, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't read the book of poetry, that's your image of God. Your image of God is this image that the world gives you. The poetry of the Bible, what it clues you into is that this picture that God paints of himself, Right. So for me in Shanghai, it was, I will give you the gates of your cities of your enemies. Meaning that when you look at the, the kings of this world, to know that God, the Lord of heaven, right, will make sure his kingdom invades those cities. So for your lives, when you do evangelism, right, the picture in your mind is that there is a day coming when everyone who calls on, on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why can't that be your friends? Why can't they be your family? Why can't they be your mom? Why can't they be your dad? Because the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is coming still. Right? But it could be tomorrow too. At least for your dad. At least for your mom. <clears throat> when you're doing ministry in church, right? And you're like, God, I need vision. I need to know how to do this ministry. I need to know like, why no one shows up when I call meetings and stuff. Right? What is, what is the promise of the poetry? On my sons and daughters. With my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit. And so, what is God not doing? God is not saying, "Hey, Leslie, tomorrow's meeting, five people show up. These are their, these are the names. This is what they'll call you. This is what they'll find their email." All right? That's what God's gonna tell you. All right? What God is gonna say to you is like, "I will pour out my spirit on you. You will be my servant." Let me, let me just trust me on this. That that promise is worth. Any amount of phone calls, any amount of contracts, any amount of like you know verbal agreements, is when your heart is fully set on God and God Himself He shows Himself to you in your life. All right. Next week we're going to go through Psalms, Psalms and the personal devotional literature. And I know I can't cover cover all of the poetry, prophetic books in one class, but please talk to me afterwards or watch this video. I'll post it on Facebook. All right, let's close. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this chance to study your word. Um, I pray that you will just help us dive deeper into your word. Um, Lord, knowing that we're just beginning our journeys with you, um, beginning our journeys of interpretation. So help us now to be faithful, to love it, um, and just to want to see more of you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.